Well, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38. You know, I remember when I was a kiddo, my dad had a job where he would travel several days a week, and he would always turn to me and say before he left, Son, you're man of the house now. You're in charge. Make sure the doors are locked at night and protect your mama. Now, I think we all realized that as a 10-year-old, it was doubtful that I was actually in charge. <laughs> Nevertheless, the sentiment was real. But I want you to imagine, dads, that if you had older boys, teenage years, and I want you to imagine that we find ourselves at war, a war so devastating that the age limit was cast out the window and you were drafted and sent to the front lines. You must leave your wife and children behind and the responsibilities fall on your teenage boys. What would that conversation sound like? How would they take over the essential roles that you currently fulfill to lead, feed, guide, and protect? Well, I hope my conversation would sound something like this. Men, and I call you that because that's what you are now. In my absence, to ensure that this family is cared for, you must step up and bear this responsibility. While I may get a paycheck for a while, there may come a time when I die on the battlefield and you will need to take up the mantle to make sure food is put on the table. Depending upon how this war goes, it may come to our shores. You are charged with the protection of the family. You will need to remember what I taught you about securing the home each night and protecting your mama. You need to know how to handle a gun. You need to remember what I taught you. Aim small, miss small. Ultimately, you must remember how I gave my life for the family and now you must do the same. Well, it's not unlike what we see here today. Paul calls the elders from the church at Ephesus. He is their spiritual father. He has been the one to lead, feed, guide, and protect for a period of three years. And now he may not see them again. With the church that he founded, he is passing the baton to shepherds, and he's giving them orders, orders to care for the family. And in doing so, he's going to use himself as a model, a model of how to shepherd effectively. And what we're going to get today is a glimpse of what really counts as ministry in the local church. What you get to see today is a sermon preached to your elders by one of your elders. Talk about putting us in the hot seat. But you don't get a pass either because we are all called to aspire to the qualities of an under shepherd. You too get to glean from this. You also get to hold us accountable and the future elders accountable to lead, feed, guide, and protect, to take that mantle of responsibility to make sure mama and the kids are cared for. Amen? So I, I'm excited about this today, and, and I'm a little nervous because I realize I'm putting this out here, and, and I need to be held accountable. We need to be held accountable. So I want you to think about this text as Paul's farewell charge to these men that he has trained, these, these children in the faith who are now becoming adults, and he's calling them men. He's passing the baton, and they are to care for the family. Would you pray with me? Father, we are delighted to look at your word today, to submit our hearts and minds to the understanding of it, with a commitment to obedience, I pray that we would seek to understand what the Apostle Paul has for us today. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how he charges the under-shepherds of the church to care for the flock, to protect the flock, to feed her, guide her, 
encourage her and exhort her, but ultimately to bear the weight of responsibility. Father, we need to hear these instructions loud and clear. We as elders need to realize both the great responsibility and the great privilege of caring for the bride of Christ. I pray that this would both be encouraging to us today and a bit daunting. I pray that in, in understanding this more, that you would make us more careful in how we do things, more energetic in how we love the body, more aware of the dangers out there, and more available to help the hurting. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We are so excited to spend this time around the fire of your word. I pray that the gospel would come through every passage in the Bible, as it always does. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let me set us in context. Paul has just begun his third missionary journey. Look back, if you will, at verse 16. Paul has set his chin like a flint to Jerusalem. Implored by the Holy Spirit, he wants to go, and he knows that bonds and afflictions await him. Verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia. Remember, Asia is a province in western Turkey. He was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to him. Four points will, will guide our time on today's journey. You might write them down. Number one, shepherd. Shepherd. Two, suffer. Three, stand guard. And finally, serve selflessly. Let's dive right in. Starting in verse 18, Dr. Luke picks up the narrative. He says, And when they had come to him, meaning the elders from the church at Ephesus, he said to them, Quote, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. All right, do you remember that? Plots of the Jews? Who were the Jews? The Judaizers who would follow him around from town to town and seek to thwart the gospel because they wanted to hold fast to a perverted view of the law. Good works will save you. Jesus didn't pay it all on the cross. And so they would come behind. They would say, it, it's good. You can be a Christian, but you got to be a Jew first. And of course, Paul says, no way. He says, verse 20, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So now remember, these are Paul's spiritual children, men who he has trained, who have sat under his teaching and watched him model the gospel in life-on-life -life discipleship. And let me say that again. These are men who were with him. How did Jesus Christ make disciples? Did he just lecture every day? Did he hand out his notes and just do tests and give syllabi? No, his disciples were with him. It was a Deuteronomy 6, 5. When you rise up and you lie down, when you walk along the way, he took them with him and he taught them and he would ask questions and he would guide their hearts and minds using scripture. So too with Paul. They were with him. They heard him teach and preach the gospel. They heard him reason with others. They heard him apply it practically. They heard him stand in the marketplace. They saw him work. They saw who he was. And so as these spiritual children, who he has trained, he is charging them. So now imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. But let's analyze verses 18 through 21. How does he say, imitate me as a shepherd? 
Imitate me as a shepherd. Well, I made a few notes here. Number one, Paul smells like sheep. That's an image in your mind. You ever smelled a sheep? Having a great time at the state fair or at the zoo and the kids, I want to go into the petting area. I want to go to the petting zoo. You know, and you get really excited and you go in and those kids coming out, come out, they stink. Okay? Take wool, never bathe it, roll it in dirt and realize you got lanolin in there and it smells. So when I say Paul smells like sheep, what am I trying to convey? Paul is not some distant shepherd wearing a robe, you know, up in a crow's nest preaching who goes to his office afterwards, might answer a few emails. He's a shepherd. Shepherd are among the sheep. Shepherds know their sheep. They touch them twice a day. I remember many years ago, I had an elder. This is a long time ago. He was an older guy. This guy knew his Bible. He had so many verses memorized, but he was never with the sheep. He didn't smell like the sheep because he was never with them. He didn't come to the functions. He didn't hang out afterwards. He didn't come early. He didn't just spend time. And I asked him one day and I said, Joe, do you not think it's important to be among the sheep? You are their shepherd. Now, I'm a younger man, so I have to kind of say this respectfully. And he flat out said, no, I don't think it's important. And I marked that date down. I said, he's done. He's done. It's a matter of time. He will not last. Now, real shepherds don't herd the sheep from, from horseback. They don't move the sheep from a helicopter. They don't monitor them from the next room with a baby monitor. They don't just text and call that shepherding. No, they're among the sheep. They model it. And a man who is unwilling, by the way, here's the test. So the next time we have an elder, a man who is unwilling to get involved in the messiness of helping sheep who get caught in a hole or in a trap is unworthy to be a shepherd, period. Do you know what the Bible calls that person? A hireling, a hireling, because they got into shepherding, they got into eldering for the wrong reason. They wanted the title. They wanted to be able to teach. But shepherding, first and foremost, is being among the sheep. Secondly, Paul serves amid slander. Look at that phrase. He served in the midst of humility tears, and trials. That didn't sound like a very fun ministry at the church at Ephesus, does it? That didn't sound like one of those things where you get up after several years as a pastor and say, so glad to have pastored here. Y'all have been a wonderful delight, and we haven't had any problems. We've had revivals every year. What does it say here? In the midst of humility? That means he's been embarrassed. He's been slandered, tears and trials, and yet he was glad to do it. Paul was the kind of shepherd, I mean, we want to emulate, we want to emulate this. He was the kind of shepherd that no job was beneath him. No job. Anything out there, he would be glad to do. He thought that, men, if you want to lead people, you serve them first. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Our Lord is the example. Listen to this quote from one commentator talking about how Christ, who is the greatest leader, was also first the greatest servant. Quote, he donned not the royal robes of a king, but the soiled apron of a slave. Do you remember that night? They gather... Christ puts on the apron, strips off his top, and starts to wash feet. And then he says, as I am doing to you, so you do to others. They're like, what? You don't understand. Slaves washed feet. Walk in some of the countries in the Middle East today, and you will know how difficult it is. Your 
feet get covered with muck. Paul, like Christ, did not shrink from his post when times got tough. Number three, he feeds them the whole truth. Paul was not a very politically correct kind of guy. He didn't tickle ears. He didn't cherry pick the, the, just the positive verses. And doggone it, people like me. He didn't skip over the tough texts. He gave them the Bible in full prescription strength because he believed it is only the truth of God that strengthens your faith. It is only the word of God that gives you the discernment and the biblical wisdom to know that which is good and that which is dangerous, that, that which pleases God and that which disappoints him. John MacArthur explains the dangers of shepherds who don't feed their sheep healthy, well-balanced meals from the word. Quote, the tragic result is that a spiritually weak flock ready to eat the poisonous weeds of false doctrine or to follow false shepherds who deceitfully promise them greener pastures while leading them to barren deserts. Now, Paul, Paul wasn't that kind of guy. I like to think of Paul as a, um, a spiritual master chef, that he would take the word of God and he would prepare culinary delights, multi-course meals that had a lot of protein in it, things that, that put meat on your bones, that when you go through difficult times in your life, when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you've got some, some sinuous spiritual muscles to rely on. Because God has strengthened your faith by his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Paul said, I'm not going to get up here and tickle ears. You're not going to get motivational messages from me. Elders, you know better. You heard me preach and teach. I use the Bible. You may not see me again. He's talking to the, to the elders at Ephesus. You need to do the same. Preach it fat and heavy, as we say. Give them the whole counsel of God. But there's something else interesting here. Paul does it not just from the pulpit, but he speaks the word of God. He does private preaching. He disciples. What does it say? I did it from in public and from what else? What's that phrase? Look at your text. House to house. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Paul was among the sheep and he took the word of God and he fed the sheep privately from house to house. Now, we've got a book in the back on the Resource Center called The Reformed Pastor. Now, that, that name, Reformed Pastor, is not talking about his, um, his systematic theology, that he's reformed. It means he's reformed in that he's different. He's different. It's by a guy named Richard Baxter. And Richard Baxter lived in a little town of about, I think... Uh, well, it wasn't little at the time. I guess it was about 2,000 people, 800 homes in the 1600s in England. And as he's pastoring this church, he came across this verse and he took it very seriously. And he said, I can't just get up and preach the word of God and only do half my job. I've got to preach it publicly and from house to house. And in that book, The Reformed Pastor, he talks about how with 800 homes in the town, each week he would visit two of them. And he would catechize the people. You know what catechism is? He would teach them the Word of God. And he would talk with them about how to apply it. And he would shape and grow their faith. And many times they weren't even believers and he would witness to them. It's very interesting. In his notes, he says, when he arrived in the village... The people were, quote, an ignorant, rude, and reveling people. <laughs> you ever think about talking about your congregation that way? How's your congregation? Well, they're an ignorant, rude, and reveling people. But you know what? Most ended up becoming converted under his ministry. Why? Because he loved them. He loved them. He loved them enough to preach the truth during worship, and they go visit them. 
from house to house. Paul's saying, that's what I did with you. Elders, don't stop the work of shepherding. And shepherding is not far off from a distance, not on a high mountain with your, with your binoculars looking out. Oh, yeah, one's not doing so good there. Well, I'll check on him tomorrow. Maybe I'll just text him. No, he's among them. George Whitfield, who was the lightning rod in the First Great Awakening, visited Kitty Minster one time. He's visiting this church, this town, 100 years after Richard Baxter. 100 years later. Do you know what he wrote about this church? This is so interesting. He says, I was greatly refreshed to find what a sweet savor of good Mr. Baxter's doctrine, works, and discipline remained to this day. I was greatly refreshed, I was greatly encouraged that as I, as I walked around the town, as I talked to people, as I enjoyed worship services, that I could, I could smell old man Baxter. He was still around, I could smell his cologne. It's a wonderful picture. His influence remained. What was his influence? Was he a great guy? Well, I'm sure he was. But what was his influence? Preaching publicly and from house to house. Isn't that interesting? All right, elders, you convicted yet? I'm just getting started. Let me beat this dead horse for a minute. I'm putting this on us. I'm preaching to myself here, so don't think I'm being nasty. Scripture knows nothing of a pastor that doesn't actually pastor. Pastor is a noun, but pastor is mainly a verb. It means to shepherd. The more technical term in Scripture is elder, overseer, bishop, you might say. We use pastor. But pastor is actually a verb. So scripture knows nothing of a pastor that doesn't actually pastor. It is not enough to just marry and bury and call yourself a pastor. If you are not among the sheep, if you are not going house to house, if you are not with them doing life together, if you are not applying the gospel in real life, this means that. If you're not replicating yourself in discipleship, pastors need to change their title or change their profession. Are you guys with me on this? Quit calling yourself a pastor if you're just a preacher. And I'm putting this in recording, in video, so that I will always do this. I love to preach, guys. It fuels me. It excites me. But it's only half the job. In fact, it's less than half the job. Pastoring, multiplication, this means that. Bearing one another's burdens, weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those who rejoice, teaching you guys to replicate yourself, teaching you to witness, caring for your marriages. That's the warp and woof of what it means to be a pastor. That's what Paul is telling these Ephesian elders. Hebrews 13, 17 is burned into our brains that one day we will give an account for those in our care. I do not want to stand before God one day and have him say, hey, so tell me, what was it like to be involved in Rebecca's spiritual growth? Oh, yeah, um, Rebecca, uh, you got a last name? Because I really... I don't recognize her. I, did the, I was the preaching pastor. We actually hired other guys to do the pastoring pastoring. Scares me to death. Listen to Alexander Strzok from his book on biblical eldership. Quote, The biblical image of a shepherd standing long hours, ensuring its safety, leading it to fresh, fresh pasture and clear water, caring the weak, seeking the lost, healing the wounded and sick is precious. The whole image of a Palestinian shepherd is characterized by its intimacy, tenderness, 
concern, skill, hard work, suffering, and love. Shepherding is a noble work. And it's noble because it's not dictated by a time clock. It's not a nine to five job. You've heard me use this illustration years ago, but do you remember the old Warner Brothers, Wiley Coyote, who plays Ralph and Sam the Sheepdog? And if you, if you, some of you older guys remember, they, they walk to the job site, which is to the pasture where the sheep are every day. And they're buddies, they even live together. They got their lunch boxes. And Ralph the Coyote, his job, when he clocks in, is to steal and eat the sheep. And Sam, well, he's the sheep dog. His, do his job is to be a shepherd, to protect the sheep. But until that time, they're, they're buddies. How you doing, Sam? I'm good. How you doing, Ralph? And, you know, and then the whistle goes off, they clock in, and that's when they go at it. That is not the image of shepherding. We don't get to clock out. Why? Because tragedies don't strike between nine and five, usually, do they? Marriages don't fall apart in the middle of the day. It's usually at night. Sin attacks at the most inopportune times. People get hurt or stuck. Trials hit at times we don't expect. No, it's a 24-7 job. And Paul is setting the example for under-shepherds. But I'm going to come back to this again. But we're all supposed to emulate them. We're all supposed to be at the ready to minister anytime, day or night. Is your home open and ready to receive someone anytime there's a knock? Should be. Are you ready to put down the TV remote, the drink for dinner and say, we got to go help someone now? We got to minister to someone now. We got to love on people now. These concepts of being with folks, serving alongside them, feeding them the truth, bearing their burdens, giving them counsel during tough times, this is the, this is the very crux of our own mission statement. Let me read it to you. Metro Bible Church exists to reflect God's glory by bringing people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and helping them to grow to be like them. We seek to do this by imparting the word and, finish it with me, imparting our lives. So I'm preaching to the elders, but you guys get to listen on because it's applicable for all of us. The great shepherd, Jesus Christ, is our model. He took 12 ragtag men and he shepherded them. And what did he say? John 13, 15. I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. All right, that's our longest one. They get shorter after this. Look at our second point, suffer. Remember, Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders. He's passing the baton. He says, I'm not going to see you again. You need to make sure you shepherd well. Here are your orders. He's commissioning them. And what does he say? He says, I need you to suffer. I don't particularly like those orders, suffering. What he's really saying is, don't run from suffering. Don't quit. Don't quit and when, when times get tough, when things get difficult, when you don't get your way, don't get your feelings hurt. If you're going to be an under-shepherd, you're going to have to do hard things. Can I speak in a modern-day vernacular? The Bible knows nothing of a snowflake shepherd. Does everyone get that picture? It is a decidedly masculine job. If you are a snowflake, gentlemen out there, pick a girl sport. Don't aspire to be an elder because your feelings will get hurt. You will have to overlook an offense. Your family will be bruised. You will be tired. You will be maligned. You will be slandered. You will have to do hard things and you won't be able to whine about it. 
Anyone want to sign up? <laughs> Look at verse 22. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying, Bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Man, Paul's got the right mindset. He's like, no matter what awaits me, it's momentary light affliction compared to the eternal glory that awaits. Or you might say it this way. He's saying, I get it. Shepherding's going to be tough, but this is what we signed up for. It's a great privilege. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Do you remember what he says in 2 Timothy, his last letter, as he's writing to Timothy, who is pastoring where? Do you remember? Ephesus. So this is interesting. Fast forward. He sends Timothy to be the pastor of Ephesus. He writes his last letter from the Mamertine prison in Rome. And he says what? I have fought. Finish with me. The good fight. I have finished what? The course. I have kept what? Whew. Do you realize your life, elder, sheep, whatever, your life will count for something if at the end of it you can say that. I didn't quit. I didn't quit. I didn't whine about it. I didn't say something's going wrong with the church. Christianity's not supposed to be like this, blah, blah, blah. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have stayed true. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. I didn't punt it. What other shepherd didn't cut and run when suffering came knocking? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, you, you, you read his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's crying out to the Father and he says, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That wasn't the cup of physical suffering as horrible as crucifixion was. Developed by the Phoenicians as the most gruesome death torture imaginable. That wasn't it. It was taking the just wrath of God upon his shoulders. The punishment that was due for each one of us because we sinned against our creator God. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ said, no, I will take their place. I will be the substitutionary atonement. I will be the Passover lamb. He knew how difficult it was going to be. He knew the suffering, but he also knew what was on the other side of that suffering. Resurrection. Victory. The death of death and the death of Christ. Jesus was willing to humble himself so that he might redeem a people for his own possession. I want you to think about that for a minute. Because times are going to get tough. We are going to suffer. Your elders are going to be maligned more and more. When we get weary and we're tempted to quit, Paul says, look at Christ as the model. When suffering was facing Christ, what does it say? He stood. He stood at his post. He humbled himself. He took it by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The Apostle Peter says in his first letter, he says, we've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. But then Paul says, but by the way, you're not going to see me again, but when you hear, when word comes through town that I'm guilty of such and such and thus and so, don't you believe it? Verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink 
from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. How would Paul be guilty of the blood of all men? They're going to slander him for this and that. But he knows real guilt only comes through one thing. Trimming the sails of the gospel. Watering down the gospel so that it might not create offense and he might not suffer. He said, "Uh uh-uh. I'm going to stand at my post. I'm going to continue to speak the truth in love. I'm going to call people to follow Christ. I'm going to give them the life-saving truth. For there is no other name by which you must be saved other than the name Jesus Christ. So when you hear bad things about me, don't you dare believe it because you're hearing it because I'm doing the right thing. Does that make sense? Don't believe the gossip and slander. He's also telling these elders, and he would write to them, 1 Timothy, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. We've talked about it before, but do you realize when you give ear, even passively, to gossip or slander, you become a party to that sin? You become a passive person participant in the sin of gossip and slander. Well, I didn't say it. And you stood there and you listened to it. If that person of whom you are talking about is not there, that conversation better be edifying. If it's not, it's gossip and it's slander. Period. And Christians are the worst offenders of this. By the way, Bible and the stereotype used to talk about it as a decidedly feminine characteristic, you know, old women and stuff like that. Can I tell you, the men are outpacing the women on this lately in churches, getting together and gossiping and slandering. Uh Uh-uh, do not receive an accusation against an elder. Paul says, you know why you can believe I'm innocent? He says it here, because you heard me. You heard me preach three years in and out. He goes, I got 500 sermons in the tank. You're going to come at me? Come at me with doctrine. There is no way that you can say these things about me when I have laid it out week after week after week after week explaining the Word of God. And I'm not not skipping the difficult stuff. And I'm applying it. But, you know, they took personal shots at him. He says, you come at me with doctrine. Number three, stand guard. Now, this is the crux of the text here. Verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. You ever been to uh, Washington, D.C. and and been to the um, National Cemetery in Arlington? What happens every couple hours? You remember? It might be on the hour. The changing of the guard. It's the tomb of the unknown soldier. The ceremony is conducted by a man called a relief commander. This is interesting. He brings in a fresh guard to relieve the retiring one. So there's three of them there, standing at the tomb of the unknown soldier. (coughs) And he performs a very important procedure to ensure that authority and responsibility transitions without a loss. Number one, he conducts a detailed white glove inspection of the soldier's M14. He needs to make sure that the weapon is in good working order, not malfunctioning, and is ready for use. Number two, all three, the retiring guard, the relieving guard, and the commander all turn to the tomb of the unknown soldier, the one who gave his life for their freedom. And what do they do? Do you remember? They salute him. Number three, The commander instructs the standing guard to, quote, pass on your orders. There must be no loss in transmission. The baton must pass intact. The new guard must not act on his own interests, his own will, or even his own discernment. He must act upon orders. 
as an officer in the United States military, he must obey. Side note here, an officer under orders doesn't ghost his post. What happens when it rains and storms there? Snows and sleets, hails, wind comes, hurricane. What happens? He stands at his post. He's a man under orders. By the way, do you know that if an officer ghosts his post, what's called AWOL, absent without leave, do you know what the punishment is? Loss of pay, dishonorable discharge, and five years in the pen. Leavenworth. Isn't it interesting? Even our unbelieving military gets it. Officers, let me be plain here. Officers of the church do not ghost their post. You do not take on the mantle of leadership and responsibility, the great privilege of caring for the bride of Christ and then quit on them. Full stop. Why? Because they're guarding. You know what the difference is? The tomb of the unknown soldier is guarded by a live guard. We guard a live flock and the tomb is empty. The reason is they are on guard. It says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Now, now don't miss this, that little phrase there, be on guard for yourselves. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? Be on guard for yourselves. What does it mean to be on guard for yourself? Well, think about it. What would be the danger that I might present myself, that Chris or Aaron might present themselves? With no outside influence whatsoever, can I ruin my ability to shepherd this flock? Say yes. Two ways, morally disqualification or doctrinal disqualification. Moral or doctrinal? I can do that to myself. I have it within me to mess it up. He says, be on guard for yourself. Listen to what Paul says, writing to Timothy, to the same church later on. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Moral, doctrinal. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation for both yourself and those who hear you. How do you disqualify yourself morally? Well, you no longer fulfill the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 or 1 Peter 5. How do you disqualify yourself doctrinally? Well, you quit believing the plain reading of the Word of God and you quit teaching it. You are no longer qualified to be an officer. You are disqualified. And you can't shepherd others first if you don't shepherd your own soul. Right living, being above reproach, holding fast to the qualifications is what keeps us in the saddle of leadership. Maintaining the right doctrine is what protects the flock. You ever think about that? Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Listen to how uh, doctrine, the teaching of God's word, is the very center of holding ourselves above reproach, keeping ourselves from disqualifying sin and protecting the flock and growing the flock in edification. 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned, the Bible, and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, the Bible, which you are able to get, give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate above reproach and then equipped able to exhort and equip and edify for every good work. It is the, the sword of the word of the Lord that is the best protection for both 
growing the flock in maturity and protecting us from savage wolves. It's a two-edged sword. One protects, one equips. There's one reason, this is one reason why we want our elders to know their Bibles. Because no amount of personal wisdom is going to be effective. No amount of charisma, no amount of soft, wonderful, kind counseling delivery is effective. We know that the only way we can better equip you to grow in Christ's likeness is to use the Word of God. And if we're not learning it, knowing it, we're not going to impart it. We're going to default to our own advice. We do not have that choice because we are stewards. We do not own this flock. We are stewards. Christ purchased this flock with his own blood. We're not hirelings. We've been put in charge to do his bidding. But there's something else here. Be on guard for these wolves. From where are these wolves coming? Don't miss that phrase. From among your own selves. I remember before I became a pastor, I'm like, yeah, something must be wrong, you know, uh, with, with uh, this church we were at, with these, these wolves popping up among the flock. We're doing everything right. I mean, we're, we're teaching the Word of God. We, we've got some good elders here that are shepherding us. I was teaching Sunday school. And, and man, why is this happening? Why are these guys popping up out of nowhere? And they're, and they're usually guys that we really liked and, and trusted and they seemed solid. They went through membership class. How could this happen? Go back 2,000 years. Paul says, expect it. No one shows up wearing the hoodie that says heretic. No one, you know, wears the t-shirt that says divider. No. Be on guard. Look, look, look across and start to notice anomalies. Verse 30 says they speak perverse things. Well, we read that and that sounds kind of strong, right? So am I supposed to pick out the guys that cuss? Is that it? Uh, the, the guys that tell dirty jokes, maybe, that, maybe that's the clue. No, perverse means to, to twist. If you've ever read the book of Jude, there's a great uh, understanding of how teachers especially can just slightly twist the word of God for their own benefit. Just side note here, for men teachers, it's always going to be Boastful pride, sex, or money. It's always one of those things. You know? Twist the word of God to lead the sheep astray for their own benefit. Those are the benefits. Jude says, they're at your love feasts. Beware. They're twisting the Bible. The more you know your Bible, the more you'll be able to recognize when someone says something wrong. Now you go to them and you give them the benefit of the doubt. Hey, you said this, or pastor, it sounded like you were saying that. Is that what you meant? And, and of course, you know, I make mistakes up here. My pastor told me when there's a, a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. <laughs> I make mistakes, but come ask me. And I'll say, you know what? It sounded like that. No, I did not mean that. I, I meant this. This is what the Bible says. Or, you know what? Let me, let me correct that. Let me explain that next week. But when you have a guy that digs in to a doctrine, doctrine means teaching, contrary from the word of God, beware. It's for his own benefit. I.e. see WFAA news the last four months of pastors falling in North Texas area. There's a reason. In every single case, it's sex, money, or boastful pride. Most of the time it's sex or money. Paul says, if you use the word of God, you'll be able to teach the flock formatively and you'll be able to run off wolves correctively. Let me say that again because it's hard. If you teach the word of God correctly, you will be able to teach and equip the flock formatively and you'll be able to run off wolves correctively. Reject a factious man after first and second warning. That's Titus 3, 5. 
Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrine. Paul is writing to young Pastor Timothy, who is at the church at Ephesus, and he says, you got men in your congregation that you need to tell them, cool it. Stop teaching that stuff. It's, it's a hard task to do, but you better do it or the flock is going to eat poisonous food and it's destructive. 2 Timothy 2.17, Paul has no fear of naming names and I'll promise you he's not doing it in a soft seafoam green voice. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Every single person in that congregation knew who Hymenaeus and Philetus were. And he said, you stay away from those guys. They're speaking perverse things. They're trying to lead you guys away. Wake up. Paul is basically expecting these elders, and I would say all elders for the last 2,000 years, to do hard things, to passionately guard the flock, to, to sympathetically and empathetically care for the flock. It's far more of an art than it is a science. You know, it's interesting, if you, if you ask your average Joe out there what an elder does, most people are going to think that they're governors, that they're like a, a corporate board, that we get together and we, we, we make decisions and we, we reason through things and, and try to decide, you know, various processes and, and, and what we should do here or there and finances. Can I tell you that's about less than 10% of what we do? Literally. In fact, most of the decisions that are made are, yeah, we kind of think that's the best direction to go to from the Bible, and we employ people to figure it out. You know if you've worked with us. Most of what we do, far and away, 90% of what we do is soul care. It's helping people grow to be like Jesus. And sometimes that growth is killing the sin or dealing with the consequences of other people's sin. And sometimes it's just growing in faith and learning their Bibles better. But all the time, it's shepherding. That's why Christ uses this term. And so as Paul is talking to these elders, as he's talking to us, he's saying, you got to know the flock you got to lead the flock. you got to feed the flock, and you got to protect the flock. you got to be a Middle Eastern shepherd. Do you realize a Middle Eastern shepherd would check each one in that flock every morning before they went out to the pasture? And then when they would come in the night, they would check each one again. They would touch them. They would feel them. You ever heard the phrase, pass under the rod? As he's putting them back in the pen, he's putting his staff down and he's counting each one. And what happens if he only has 99? Does he say, well, hey, that's an A plus. No. He leaves the 99 and he goes and he pursues the one. That's shepherding. When we train our men to be shepherds, do you know what I tell them? If you take on this mantle of responsibility... I want the flock to be the last thing you think about before you go to bed at night and the first thing you think about in the morning. Now, I'm in no way telling you to deny your personal physical family, but what I'm telling you is to take on this mantle is going to require far more than your hand obedience, far more than the hours in the day. It's going to require your very heart I want you to be consumed with the welfare of the flock. I want you to, in a, in a godly way, I want you to worry about them, you might say. Being consumed for them, care for them, check on them, get real with them, even when those conversations hurt. Why? Because you're a spiritual daddy, and that's what dads do, amen? They care. They love. 
And by the way, a shepherd in both caring and edifying the flock and protecting, a shepherd carries two tools. What are they? A staff and a what? A rod. A staff of direction and a rod of protection. You know, I love Ireland. I've been seven times. It's one of my most favorite countries. And in Ireland, the shepherds carry a, a rod with kind of a heavy weighted ball type uh, thing on on the end. And it's called a knockerby. And, you know, you think of a shepherd as kind of a, you know, easygoing guy, you know, kind of relaxed. That's why he got into it. You know, wanted a lot of time to read, maybe sing, write poetry. No, it, it is a full time job. Do you know what they use this knockerby for? He can throw that thing like a weapon and hit a wolf from a long distance. He's not going to let anyone get near his little lambs. Isn't that a great picture? Listen to Paul sum it in verse 31. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Chris quoted that verse this morning, Colossians 1, 28. Admonish, nuthateo. We use the word of God to warn people of the devastating effects and the devastating offense to God of sin. We are not saved by our good works. We are saved by grace through faith. But the faith that saves does good works to please our Lord. And so we admonish, hey, stay away from that. Hey, don't do that. Hey, let me encourage you, pursue holiness. Well, finally, he says, I want you to serve selflessly. Verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. So he's coming back to defending himself again. Verse 34, you yourselves know, recognize it again, you yourselves, same thing as verse 18, that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who are with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul's saying, hey, follow my lead, shepherds. You want to be an elder? Follow my lead. Imitate me. I didn't get into this for the money. I didn't get into this for the fame. You know that. You've read the pamphlets, the newspapers. You, you, you've, you, you've heard the, the talks of the people that are slandering me. I, I, I didn't get in this for the wrong reason. And, and when I got into it, I didn't use this position to make money off of you, to get favors from you. I served alongside you. Again, Paul writing to the very same city. He talks about the qualifications of an elder gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. You don't have to live in the 21st century to see that a temptation for a lot of pastors is to do easy work and skim off the top. Oh, they may not be putting their hand in the plate, but they find ways to make a lot of money. And when you start making money, you have a divided heart. Christ talks about that, doesn't he? You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Because you're going to want one more than the other. And which one wins out? Paul says, that was not me. He says, look, shepherding Christ's church is not a job. It's an enlistment. It's a commission. It's standing at your post your time, your money, your business, your relationships, all of that goes in to advancing Christ's kingdom as a representative of his life and his work and care for his church. You put it all on the line. It's a full-time occupation. And then watch what he does before he departs. What does he do? Look at it. He cries. That chokes me up. You know, you think, golly. If I was tempted to say, Paul's a hard nose, he weeps with him. 
He loves them enough to be hard on them. He loves them enough to, to really set the charge strong and say, this is not an option. You're caring for Christ's bride. So here's my question for us. Those of you who've been listening on as I beat the under shepherds here a little bit. What would it look like for you to examine the next elder candidate? Next time we put someone up here and we say, you know, we've trained this guy for several years. We think that he meets the qualifications, but we want you to examine him. We want you to take a month. What would that look like? It's not asking him his favorite verse. It's not asking him his favorite Bible story. What would it look like? You're about to put him in a position to feed you spiritually, to care for your soul, to walk with you through the worst trials that you don't even know that are coming and to protect you from savage wolves. What are you going to ask him? That's, that's a high calling. Have you thought about that? Well, I've got a few here for you. How about this? I want you to tell me about your doctrine. I want, to, I want you to tell me about what you understand about this or that or the other. I want you to tell me how you would apply that. Let me get specific. How are you going to pursue me when I fall into a hole of sin? How are you going to help my marriage when it runs a ground. How are you going to deal with someone that starts teaching wrongly or tries to split the church? Tell me. And, and I want to listen. Is, is it a guy that is afraid to pick up a weapon? Is, is it a guy that values his me time? Is it a guy that likes to be vague in how he says things? Or is it a guy that will enter into your world and care for you? and carry you when you need to be carried. Protect you from those who will hurt you. Feed you healthy, robust, multi-course spiritual meals. Will he be available? I would ask him, are you gonna be available? Ask him this, can I stop by any time? Uh, you may not have time for me, but, but will you receive me? Can I call you? Do I have your phone number? Will you minister to me? What are you going to do to those who start to slander the church? What are you going to do when your wife gets tired of ministry, when she's beat up? How are you going to shepherd her? What are you going to do when your kids get tired of being pastor's kids? You grill this guy because you love him and he's about to take on the most important post of his life. What will you do to protect the bride that the Lord has purchased with his own blood? But let me leave us with this. Paul has left us with our orders. Richard Baxter, the reformed pastor, reasons with us. He reasons with those of us, and man, I've been there, when you start to say, this is too hard. This is not fun anymore. This is not uh, fair. This is not fair. Richard Baxter writes from the 1600s, let his, let his voice from the grave resonate with you. Oh, then let us hear these arguments of Christ whenever we feel ourselves grow dull and careless. Did I die for them? And wilt that not look after them? Were they worth my blood? And are they not worth your labor? Did I not come from heaven to earth to seek and save that which was lost? And will you not go next door or to the next street or the next village to seek them? How small is thy labor and condescension compared to mine? I debased myself to this, but it is thy honor to be so employed. Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation, and I was willing to make thee a co-worker with me? And will thou refuse 
that little that lieth upon thy hands? Translation, Christ says, I did so much, I gave everything. The prince of heaven threw off his royal robes, stepped down into dirty Palestine, sunk himself into human flesh, set his chin like a flint to the cross, lived the perfect life which we could not live, and died the death that was deserved for us. And now we have the privilege to be under shepherds, stewards of his bride, and we complain about it. And he's saying basically, seriously, really, really, you're complaining about a little bit of suffering, a little bit of slander, a a few late nights, a little bit of poverty, really. How about a little perspective? That's preaching to me. 